I, uh, I absolutely love the comments on the, the timing aspect because I think that is um, that is a fundamentally interesting thing, especially with enterprise, right? For, for those of us who have been dealing with cloud and enterprise for some time, I think it's hard to escape the conclusion that um, if the business isn't an online business as its primary um, thing, so if it's a web two, not a web 2.0 business, in general, enterprise is behind every other sector in terms of cloud adoption, right? It's, it's behind enterprise. In a lot of ways, it's behind government, although I think it's catching up quickly. So the, the timing of an enterprise pass is part of the question, part of the problem. And we'll see how that uh, how that develops. But I think um, I'm seeing a lot of signs of a rapid shift in terms of cloud understanding and cloud adoption over this year, 2012, and over 2013. And I think it'll be a very different story if we gather again a year from now. That said, let's get the next panel up. And uh, so I'm going to take it that uh, Sam, are you the moderator? Okay, I'll allow you to uh, introduce the panel and uh, its its topic and its players. And so um, if you guys are ready. Um, welcome on stage, Sam Charrington, who uh, a good friend of mine for a long time, a, another analyst, an independent analyst uh, on cloud who has a tremendous amount of experience in the space uh, and uh, was very involved in the early cloud camps as well. And Sam, uh, I'll let you take it away. Thanks. Thanks, James. All right. So uh, the topic of this panel discussion is private versus public uh, versus hybrid platform as a service. Uh, and it strikes me that while you know this particular issue, public, private, hybrid, has been discussed quite uh, in quite a lot of detail for quite some time in the context of infrastructure as a service, there are some nuances that are particular uh, to the the platform as a service context and discussion. So that's really going to be what we're spending the time on exploring this morning. Uh, before we jump in, I'd like to just ask the panel members to introduce themselves. And so introduce yourself, kind of your company, and talk a little bit about your, your context in this discussion, what your, your company's role is and your position. Sounds good. Thanks, Sam. My name is Bart. I'm the CEO of Active State. We are, know three things really well, developers, enterprise, and open source. And in context of PaaS, we have a solution called Staccato. It's an application platform for creating your own PaaS on-premise or on, on public. It doesn't matter to us. And from our perspective, we saw a real need in the marketplace for a private PaaS solution. But that doesn't mean private PaaS is the only answer. To me, it's not, a, it's not hosted versus private. It depends on you and your needs. And so there isn't, there isn't a right answer. So that's uh, how I see it overall. Uh, I'm Chris Tacey from AppFog. Um, we're kind of in a unique position because we have two products, one of which is public only and one of which is public, private, and hybrid. So I can talk from both perspectives. Um, we're probably a little bit different than a lot of folks here because we're really purely about developers. Um, I'm a little biased on that as a developer. My name is John Willis. Um, I work for a company. I'm a VP of Customer Service and Enablement at Stratus. We are a cloud management solution provider. We work with management solutions around different um, past solutions. For example, Cloud Foundry is one of those. So. Good. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Haddad, Vice President of Technology Evangelism with WSO2. Uh, WSO2 is the only complete cloud-native application platform that is 100% open source. And I'm interested in understanding how the application platform architecture will change to support cloud characteristics, specifically if we're going to bring hybrid cloud, clouds together and have a hybrid offering, we need to raise up the infrastructure services and make them agnostic of the underlying application platform that might be delivered by the vendors. And I'm Bill Platt. I'm a head of operations for Engine Yard. Um, at Engine Yard, we've run private pass before. We currently operate one of the largest public pass in the world. Um, we have history of running multiple types of these things. And um, I think the interesting part of this is if you look at what the previous speakers talked about, 
it's pretty clear that it's going to evolve and some interesting things are going to happen over the next couple of years. Absolutely, absolutely. So to get things started, I'd like to ask each of you to talk a little bit about, in your perspective, how does the issue of public, private, and hybrid, uh, how is that issue different in the context of platform as a service as opposed to in the infrastructure discussion? You know, how do issues like abstraction levels that we see in past, you know, play with that discussion? You can start, John. Okay, I like to go first. So, um, you know, so you know, when I first started following, the, you know, the infrastructure, Amazon came out. Uh, actually worked with James a lot early on, talking about, you know, early cloud implement implementations and. Uh, and when I first saw it pass, like Engine Yard and then Heroku, honestly, I wasn't a big fan. And, and, and the reason was, and not because those are great companies, in particular Engine Yard, I want to make this clear, Engine Yard has been instrumental in producing a lot of open source and technologies that have benefited of all. So this is not a negative against Engine Yard in any way. But I, I always said that it you know, passes the primrose pass, in that, um, that like, I'm a firm believer, I'm an ops guy, I'm a DevOps, I'm an ops guy, and I believe owning your infrastructure in the early stages of cloud is really one of the most important things, or one of the things you don't want to give control away from. And, and, and I'm, I think I'm still a firm believer of that, that, you know, that passes work really well for prototyping. And, but I, I see very few core services businesses today running on a, on, a, on a pass. Now, I think that will change. But as we, I, you know, I won't hog the mic here, but I, as we get into the discussion, I'd be willing to share my thoughts of why today we don't see a whole lot. Of, we don't see Facebook, for example, running core services. We don't see Amazon. We don't see um, you know, Instagram is a good example of a, a, a really fancy new startup. No, no real past core services on there. So, uh, anyway, that's, yeah. that's my and to expand something. on what John is saying is that we're we're seeing a similar thing. Is that if you go back to your original question, Sam, of what has changed and what's different, is that I think when you started with the whole cloud computing era, it was really nice in a public environment, but and it was good for non-mission critical type uh, applications. But as you as enterprises started exploring cloud and PaaS. They looked at it and they said, well, this is nice, and, and I've seen this use case time and time again. A developer have done something on AWS, and it works great, but then he brings it to DevOps IT, and he say, well, you can't run that. You can't run that over there. It's got to be inside our firewall, and this is what John has been pointing to. And is, so we see a natural evolution now of organizations. They want to embrace this. They, they like what they see in a Heroku or an engineer because it's really good stuff, but they want to have control. And so that's a key differentiation that we're seeing. So I'm just really emphasizing what, what John has said. I, I will take a slightly different tact. <laughs> of course you would. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, thanks for the compliments. I do appreciate it. Um, but in fact, we see dozens of large companies that weren't large companies very long ago that are now growing into being large companies. And they built that business on a pass. And not always engine yards, other companies as well. In fact, we, in a hybrid mode, because admittedly that is a common thing for people that get to where data becomes sensitive, but we, we have, we had a company grow as fast or faster than any company in the history of, uh, of computing that ran on our pass. I mean, these guys grew fast, not naming the names, but they grew ridiculously fast. And so I think one of the opportunities that it affords people is if they have an existing model, everything these guys just said is absolutely true and some of the speakers earlier, it's absolutely true that they have a whole bunch of things that they have to do with. But when you have a fresh new business, it's a great way to start and can allow you to grow really fast. So uh, Chris, before you get started, you raised a really interesting question in some of our earlier discussions. Uh, is, hybrid is hybrid pass, is it really the right solution or is it a way for us to relieve the tension in these panel discussions? Yeah, so uh, I, I'm unfortunately well known for, for stirring up shit. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know, I am the person who created or popularized the no-ops concept. Uh, <laughs> so, Give him some credit. That was a good one. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, so in my opinion, uh, first and foremost, I think private versus public is an incredibly important concept around infrastructure as a service. I think it's one of the most significant decision points you can make. I think when it comes to platform as a service, it's largely a distraction. Um, and I think that things like hybrid cloud, particularly when you're talking about platform as a service, are a way 
for us to be able to get along. Fundamentally, if you look at something like Cloud Foundry, um, you can see th that we are moving towards a world where you could have a platform as a service that simply targets infrastructure as a service that is either public or private, which means your developers can actually work on the same paths no matter where they're deploying to. Right, it's, it's only if we, one, standardize on Cloud Foundry, uh, two, as long as we're not running, say, WebSphere on Cloud Foundry and then trying to uh, build clustering and failover across WebSphere broker oh. domains that live across <laughs> multiple oh. data centers. So there's a whole hell of a lot of FUD here and, and hype when it comes to hybrid use cases and whether the application platform or application platform as a service, which is required to build apps, is actually hybrid cloud enabled. Oh yeah, but it doesn't really matter whether the pass itself is public or private or both. I mean, fundamentally, to me as a developer, what I care about is A, first and foremost, don't make me use different methods, different processes, and different tools depending upon where I deploy to. I mean, I'm sorry, that's fucking idiotic. So, <laughs> yeah, well, you're right. It's got to be consistent. So, yeah. so I just kind of had an epiphany. Imagine that, right? So I, I think I just realized what my pain point was with this idea, notion of a public pass. And I think you just hit something on that I guess had no clarity on, which is it's, I guess it's the non-capability to have open source. That's the thing. I guess, you know, I just didn't realize that. I was kind of searching why am I annoying of like, and again, not, I think you're right. I think that Engine Yard, that a way to build a business or build a hybrid where like your web services front end, like a Ruby front end for a back end core service, that's a brilliant example of, I hate the word hybrid cloud, but, but a hybrid scenario. It's the current term. Right? But, right, exactly. So let's deal with it, right? But, but the more important thing is it's the ability, you know, me being an infrastructure guy, thinking about operations a lot, and by the way, I hate the term no ops, but we can, <laughs> we can deal with that at a different time. Um, so, um, but the, um, is, the is being, ha having the ability to control your infrastructure, particularly in these early days of movements and things that, we, you know, that we're, uh, you know, I heard every other panelist so far today talk about that we're early in the movement, early movement. That's got to say clarity to you that, like, we really got to be real careful about our choices and our flexibility and adaptability, and, and, that, and I think it is open source. And Thank also, that, and, and also <laughs> avoiding, most of all, avoiding, you know, my, my current fascination. Uh, so well, I think like a lot of the people on the panel here, I've been doing this for quite a while. I mean, I've been in this business for more than 20 years now. Um, looking back at it, uh, as far as I'm concerned, vendor lock-in destroyed innovation in enterprise software. And I think we're right now at risk of that occurring with the cloud. And I, I think the decisions we make right now, we need to keep that in mind at all times. I mean, I don't want to see a situation where all of a sudden, as a developer, I'm stuck with some of the crap I had to put up with in trying to extend SAP. You know, uh, but, but hang on. So just, uh, let me interject. I think there's, uh, <coughs> I appreciate your viewpoint on that, but it strikes me that there's some tension between the way we market pass, you know, is this abstraction where you don't have to care about all the underlying stuff, what it's made out of, and <laughs> the view that you're describing as but someone who wants to get their hands dirty so with So give me a segue for what I just wanted to say is, I had a conversation with a guy who runs operations for Facebook at a puppet conf. Um, uh, end of last year, and he and he told me flat out, they basically it, it's very rare that they're going to accept the product at Facebook that isn't open source because at their scale, they have to be able to change it. They know they're going to change it, and you know what? I've heard that three times now from other event, large organizations like this. So as we grow into web scale infrastructure, that's just one of many that I, I have to have control. Uh, you know the idea that I so the idea that I'm going to have to modify it. And we can go down a whole litany test of like, okay, what if I've gone down this path with, you know, I, I get your point. The, it's the, it's the, there's always the conundrums of like, there's, this is great and this is great, how do I mm -hmm. solve this problem? But the idea of a pass is, um, you know, this simplicity and this ability to get started really fast. But, but when you start thinking about the competitive core service businesses, look at them all and look where they mostly live. And it's typically in infrastructures that they control. And I think there's a list of reasons, uh, acquisitions. You know, what if you have a framework based on this and you acquire another company or you get acquired? And this particular public patch, or, or let's say now through my epiphany, a closed source infrastructure now doesn't support Node.js. 
and this business is completely based on Node.js. What do you do now? Replicate? <laughs> you know, what about you know, data confidence? What if you have forced now to move data in other parts of the world? Well, what if this public pass or this controlled environment that you don't have the source to, you mm -hmm. know, it basically, oh, well, we, you know, it's 2014 before we build a data center in that region of the world. Well, well so of, course, the, of course, the AppFa guy will just say, well, <laughs> with Cloud Foundry, it supports all app servers and <laughs> Node.js, and you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but th there's a concept of leaky interfaces and and technology details rising up through the solution stack. And when you're looking, again, at clustering uh, Node.js servers uh, providing failover, the technology details, you know, as, as John says, becomes uh, very gory and very real uh, to, to understand. And what we need to do is to look out over the next few years and choose vendors that are actually abstracting away these under, underlying technology details. For example, with the PASs that you play with today, do you actually have to define number of server instances? Are you being billed on server instances? Are you being billed on CPU or network I.O. or storage? You know, those are fundamental infrastructure details that me, as the application developer, I don't want to care about it. But as one of our time, keynotes says, I want to be able to subscribe to services, APIs, and channels, and actually demonstrate a bill based on business value of those type of entities, not with how many MIPS or how much storage I'm using. But at the same time, I agree on that abstraction layer, and that's the ultimate nirvana of PaaS, but at the same time, we're seeing customers in the marketplace that don't want to be abstracted yet. They're, they're saying, look, I have a specific framework, a specific database, specific language, specific web server that they care about. So, I mean, it's, it's hard to abstract when your customers are saying, no, no, I want more detail. Yeah, what I think we found in, in running the numbers of different types of customers that we've been running is that we kind of need to be able to do both and, and literally do both. Create that abstraction layer where the people don't want to know and don't need to know, and the better you do that, the easier it is for the developer at the pure application level. But as sometimes is the way, when applications get real and then they kind of organically grow, they need control levels down in the stack again. And when they do, if you can allow that, not preclude it, you can keep that guy going with you longer. So I think it's not a either or necessarily, it can be a both. And, and I'm gonna say this real quick in, in that, I don't have a horse in this race, I'm probably the only one on this panel that doesn't have a horse in this race. I'll manage them all, right, in Stratus. <laughs> hey, by the way, Stratus will manage them all. But, hey, but uh, the point is, I do, I am a fanboy of Cloud Foundry. And, and the reason I'm a fanboy of Cloud Foundry is it seems that they've done everything right, right? In other words, they, you know, if you look at the adoption of the platforms that have fit in so quick and so well there, like to the point of, I think er early on companies are afraid of going too far down a, a past infrastructure abstraction layer, and, and, and that is a valid concern, but you look at what has happened and the, how quick, you know, like your company, AppRock, and all these other companies have added, you know, Node.js and PHP and, and, and Python and all these things into the stack like un ridiculously fast. It, it gives me that a better comfort level than really honestly anything and I do need yeah, to. Yeah, I, I mean, same as that, that active state. You know, we built Staccato on top of Cloud Foundry that. and uh, it allowed us to move incredibly fast. Well, it's actually, you know, to go back to the open source thing because this is critical. <laughs> if you look at Cloud Foundry, one of the advantages is if you want to have abstraction that supports a range of languages that truly is polyglot, and, and you want it to have better than, say, an 80% solution, it, it kind of has to be open source. I mean, you really, you really can't do it otherwise. And then if you also want to say, oh, we all not only want to abstract all these different languages, we actually want to abstract infrastructure to the point where you can deploy across infrastructure providers, yeah, yeah you better be open source at that point. So another, so another benefit to that thought and back to the hosted versus private yeah. <laughs> point is um, also if it if you're basing a lot of things on open source it allows for you know somebody say in the enterprise area they can start doing some development in on open source based things while they're working their way toward using usage of pass and that allows them to play earlier and test things easier so that's another benefit of that and it in allowing them to do both hosted and 
private pass. I think that's a great segue into the next area that I wanted to explore. John kind of threw a gauntlet down and said that he doesn't see uh, any kind of core production use of uh, public, public pass. And uh, I think it'd be useful to, to have you guys talk a little bit about the use cases of each of the different deployment scenarios and what you're seeing happening. Obviously, development uh, is one. Uh, anyone want to start yeah, off with that? I mean, I don't think, I don't think John was advocating. I think there are production in hosted. There's production cases, as, as Bill has pointed out. There's real live production cases in hosted, and there's real live production cases in private as well. In the case of Active State, um, I can give two very quick examples. One, a very large financial company. They have 40,000 existing applications. They have a cloud infrastructure, and they're looking for a PaaS to move those existing applications onto their cloud infrastructure. There's a classic use case. Another use case is a media company uh, serving up millions of web pages, and they want to standardize the way that they are deploying their, 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 their CMS system uh, onto their cloud infrastructure, and they want to use a private PaaS model because they want to have control, they want it behind their firewall. Those, those are two quick examples. I can give some real world examples as well. I mean, I actually do definitely disagree with the idea that there is not uh, production stuff running on public pass right now. However, to be clear, Chris did say core. So that's a different. That's what I said. Oh, enterprise. Core, well, I used right? two words, core. enterprise and core. Yeah, so that, that, that's, that's very different. I mean, when we're talking about these <coughs> hyper growth startups, um, th that's not enterprise. So um, on the other hand, I can give you a couple of data it points. Is now. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are many enterprises which oh, they true. had those valuations. Oh, no, I mean, yeah. so I can give you a couple of data points to show that, I mean, if you look at, at where we're at, you know, we've got roughly 50,000 developers working on the platform right now. We've seen uh, exponential growth sustained from January of 2011. I think you can sit there and say, yeah, okay, that's, that's legit. Uh, we've got production apps on there that are scaling right now to, I think, the largest is running on 135 instances. And so, well, it, it comes down to what are the, the corporate policies. For example, on the prior panel in regards to risk management, you know, is the platform as a service provider in for a non-on-premise offering, you know, choosing uh, those out there, do they support PCI standards? Do they support government uh, standards in regards to security? Uh, do they provide the correct location for the data? Data cannot go outside the EU or, you know, other countries and, and uh, keep the corporations, you know, in compliance. So, the, you know, what we find is that location matters, you know, as well as the technology off matter that's being offered, as well as uh, trying to define the cost of ownership uh, between on-premise and and public, as well as the skills required. So it's a, it's a multifaceted evaluation framework uh, that drives the hosted versus private decision. So th there's two types of companies that I'm interested in right now, and they're enterprises that want to, or that are, that are open up to these new ideas of infrastructure, cloud, DevOps. And then there are what I would call the DevOps model companies. And neither of those type of companies, and I haven't seen them all, but I've seen quite a few, will tell me that their core business is running on a, a public pass or, or a closed source pass. Um, and again, I haven't seen them all, but the ones that I really admire and are poster childs for this thing we call DevOps, um, Etsy, I mean, you just go down the line of these companies. So, so again, I, I, I will lay the gauntlet down that I think that, I won't say that any company can't be successfully built on a public pass, that's foolish. But I will tell you, the ones that value the kind of you know, in, in DevOps we call the aha to ka-ching, like how do you get something from a whiteboard all the way through to uh, a production, you know, core service that actually gives customer value. Um, those type of companies that are really concentrated on products like Chef and Puppet that are key to this concept of infrastructure as code, those type of companies, uh, I don't see them running their core businesses on, um, on public passes. But that's a, that's, a, that's a data sample set issue. I mean, frankly, when you pre-select by saying, oh, they have to be DevOps or ops companies, you're always going to see that just like, you know, I, I ran a poll not that long ago, bad sample set again, because it was via Twitter, so it was my Twitter followers, and I said, who's going to determine your past solution decision? 
But, but these are guys. And I ran <coughs> four to one in favor of developers. But, That's but, not accurate. But but I will say that these companies, like Instagram, <laughs> is a great example. I right? think Instagram is a company that, you know, talk about the fastest growing uh, to my mind. You know, th uh, two years, uh, thirty million users, um, basically um, a billion dollar exit in two years. Um, um, with two back-end system engineers, right? And, and there was no pass involved with that company. Again, I, I think that the, the model of these bleeding edge and own your own infrastructure, you better own it from, from, end, from soup to nuts. Uh, those are models. Hey, 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 I'm just one dumb guy. No, 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 you're, to cast no, 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 no. I mean, honest, <laughs> honestly, like, I think, I, think this is, I think it's a really interesting, we're seeing right now, so this is my fifth startup. I'm very lucky. I, the last four have all been successful. So I've seen this kind Bless of. You. Bless <laughs> you, my man. It's luck. No, it's luck. <laughs> I'm um, just the opposite. I've had five failed startups. So. <laughs> so, so, so what that means is you should listen to him and not me, because he's actually learned. Whereas I'm like, I'm a freaking genius. Um, but no, seriously. So the thing is, is that what we're seeing right now, I think, is that uh, we're seeing this huge, this huge split in our industry, where there's this conflict and. A friend of mine claims it's an it's a age old conflict, which is the conflict between ops or systems engineering or however you want to describe it back through time and developers or software engineers. Or it's an ongoing battle, but I think we're seeing the same sort of tension exist right now. Who's going to own the cloud? Well, well, well the, the the fundamental conflict here is whether it's on premise, in core, or or outsourced. So you have colo facilities. You know, did they have this same kind of conversation when colo facilities and, and uh, other, you know, out of data center offerings were available? You know, and, yes, and, they yep. had those same conversations. <laughs> oh, yes, I worked did. at Sun Microsystems back <laughs> oh, yes, then they when we did. built all the colos and sold it to all the on-premises. <laughs> right, right. And, and did colos, you know, kill the, the in-house data center? No. You know, does virtual private servers kill the on-premise server that I have in, in my house? N no. You, you need a, a myriad of different uh, deployment models and responsibility models, whether I own the server or you, you are responsible for the server, to, to, to make sense based on the project context. And so this is where, you know, build, having a hybrid heterogeneous environment you know, will be the end game here, even though people will sway you towards one end of the spectrum or another. And then the concept is, does the cloud management technology, does the financial models, does the application platform model, does the application itself support hybrid deployment scenarios? And today, 95% uh, of the solutions out there do not support it. Also, like, be cautious if anyone tells you that there is a correct answer. Uh, as someone who <laughs> formerly worked in a company that did a lot of work with the intelligence community, let me tell you, there are entire industries that are not going to have this choice. Sure. So let's switch gears a little bit with, uh, you know, cross-cloud portability has always been a concern for, uh, particularly for enterprises. And with the rise of Cloud Foundry, we're starting to hear some conversation about the PaaS layer being the enabler for cross-cloud portability. And my question for you guys is, is the pass layer really the right place for that enablement to happen? Is it, you know, standards? Uh, is there some, uh, an obvious, <laughs> well, uh, so John doesn't want to talk about this. Let's, uh, I mean, the short go answer, ahead, Mark. The short answer is, look at the use case. So it's, it, you know, it's about the developer. The developer has written an application. He wants to deploy it. In some organizations, they are allowed to deploy themselves. In other organizations, they have to go to somebody else. But it makes sense that if you're using your PaaS to develop your application and then deploy, it makes sense that the PaaS layer, yeah, that's where you want to control it. Because maybe in the morning, you want to deploy in one cloud, and in the afternoon, you want to deploy in a different cloud. So a high level to me, yeah, it should be at the PaaS layer. So I spent a year and a half at OpsCode, the, the guys who um, wrote Chef, right? <laughs> and, and so, you know, that, that philosophy is this idea of infrastructure as code. And, and so, you know, like, it seems like I've been leaning to this side of the panel here now. <laughs> I've got to kind of go to this side, which is that, I mean, I love Cloud Foundry, and I had stated that. But right now, you know, put, put a gun to my head, and I, I truly believe in things like Chef and Puppet as abstraction and infrastructures. And because, I, I could tell you, a company called Sonyan, 
Um, and if you look at these guys, they, they've actually moved their, they started their infrastructure out on Amazon. They actually won an early award on Amazon. They won kind of wanted to start up awards. They've done really well. They do, um, they, they collect um, chat, email, everything. They do, they're an archiving service. In fact, they actually are the back end for Lotus from IBM. So they, uh, IBM, the, the archiving option of Lotus actually goes to Sonya. But here's the story. They, they went from, they started out on Amazon. IBM, because they were such a big customer, forced them to go to the IBM mm -hmm. Smart Cloud. They converted to the Smart Cloud, and they've recently converted to Joint, yeah. right? And and the re and every time I've I've done podcasts with the guys over there and um, DevOps Cafe, by the way, um, <laughs> they, <laughs> um, and, and I've asked them, and I know the answer. I was like, how long did it take? And they're like, it basically took about two or three weeks, right? Like moving a full infrastructure, and I don't care. You can call it cloud. All you guys who know who work with clouds know. That's not an easy task to move from those three different enterprises. And I, I asked, well, okay, I know the answer. How were you able to do it so fast? And because they bulletproofed their infrastructure, in this case with Chef, and their whole, everything that deployed, everything about their infrastructure from configuration yeah, You, you to can do it even easier with PaaS. You can go well, up one layer above. And we, yeah, I mean, it, it, given that, that it's you- way easier than Chef and Puppet with a PaaS layer. And I think the other thing to toss in there is, you know, but without having it only be... Right? What if you had to change the stack? What if that, this particular cloud changed? Did, like, did, for example, if you're going to join it and you're using basically, um, you know, the, the, um, the whatchamacallit, the, 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 not the KVM, the, the, the Zen... Not yeah, the, the, with PaaS it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I think it would. With the placement of processes and infrastructures, if you're using, if, if you're using kind of the... Um, the the Sun version of the container-based operating systems. Mm -hmm. you, you, there, there could be arguments for how you might want to um, architect completely different in a joint operating system environment because of its ability, in some cases, to use KVM, in some cases, to use yeah. a container-based system. I'll add to this. No, wait, I'll add to this to make this, it a little bit more actually, interesting. This is actually you a, mentioned a, a real, couple of weeks. No, that, 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 a real world, that. Exam, real world <laughs> examples that we've been through because we've been running on multiple infrastructures and we continue to run on multiple infrastructures and we will continue to grow the number of infrastructures. And we've moved workloads across many different infrastructures. Mm -hmm. We move them similar to what John said. We can move somebody and we have moved somebody in a week from one yeah. infrastructure provider to another. And it does depend on what the application is actually doing. So you can do it at the pass layer, depending on what the application is doing. Sometimes, and we love Chef and Puppet, as you know, we use the crap out of those things because it's a way to fill the gap sometimes where you have to, mm -hmm. and you can do it at that layer. And sometimes you actually have to do it right from the bottom of the infrastructure up, where we work in a colo with somebody, we help set up the data model, and then we connect the things, right? So you can do it, and you have to use the right tool at the right level, and I only say this because we do it all the time. There's, so we've got, well, actually, so the, actually, I, so this, is, this is important to me. This is my, this is my sweet spot, I agree. So first and foremost, uh, there's two ways to do this. You've heard one, you've heard the other. They both work. Um, however, uh, this is a personal story. Why I joined AppFog? Uh, I joined AppFog because my last startup, before we got bought, um, we were taken down by the EC2pocalypse. We were down for roughly 10 hours, and we permanently lost 10% of our data. Uh, I went from being the biggest fanboy of AWS ever to basically thinking it is a steaming pile of shit mm -hmm. um, in a 12-hour period. So uh, when I interviewed with AppFog, Lucas, the CEO and founder, said to me, with our coming product, we're going to have one-click migration from one infrastructure to another. I thought he was smoking crack, but I figured give it a try. So yeah, you can do this multiple ways. I'd be happy to show anyone here how it works on AppFog. You click a button, it takes roughly a minute. Yeah, but that's with a very, very simple solution stack. If, you are t if your solution ties into, say, a Kerberos ticketing system. Yeah, then you're, then you're actually running either. You're either going with professional services plus chef and puppet, or you're going with a complete reprovisioning. Take your pick. Um, it depends on the use case. There's two ways right. to do it. So, so in an enterprise setting and to gain enterprise uh, class customers, the Fortune 500 Global 2000, they have very complex applications that require a complete application platform as a service stack, for example, an enterprise service bus, identity management infrastructure, business process management, 
uh, all connected together, uh, going back to legacy uh, data backends, and moving such an infrastructure en masse at a click of a button is nowhere where we're near today. Depends on how you architect it. I agree. And to be quite <laughs> frankly, the, the, some of the, hot, the hottest growing area of infrastructure code right now for Puppet and Chef is the enterprise. So some of the largest enterprises, oh, yeah. one right after another, are... are, are so we've actually, at Active State, we've taken a lot of that pain away because I totally agree with what you're saying. We see that. But we've taken some very complex legacy apps and taken it migration from weeks to less than a half a day. It, it, the, the reality is, is that there are going to be edge cases that that's never going to work. Yeah. I mean, and I, that, I would be absolutely <coughs> lying to you if I said otherwise. Mm -hmm. Five minutes. All right, so uh, last question, Bart. You, you mentioned complex enterprise applications. Um, you know, it strikes me that there's, a, uh, there's some tension between you know, the simplicity that, is, uh, that we all value but is particularly core in public platform as a service types of environments where the opportunity to hook the user is you know, minuscule. Uh, and uh, what's required on the private side, which is the ability to support a wide variety of application configurations. So there's this tension. How do we manage that? How do we address that as a community? Well, I, I think the tension is always going to be there. I, I mean, I love the talks this morning. One of the talks saying the death of enterprise apps. Well, there's no way. I mean, as long <laughs> as there's enterprises, there's going to be enterprise apps. I mean, COBOL is still out there. IMS, CIC. You know, <laughs> and it's the, enterprise apps are not going to die. I mean, the world is not run just by small startups. I mean, I love startups. I've been running startups for years. But there are many big companies out there that have large needs. And so I think it's a question of both. There, it's not a tension. It's, it's not going to go away. It's They both exist. And, and it's our job as solution providers to d provide solutions that cover both arenas. And I don't think... One organ, one vendor can cover it all, and that's why we all have our different value adds in the, in the ecosystem. At Active State, we focus specifically on enterprises and private paths. That's it. it so yeah, one well, thing that well, I think well, is with, one with, thing that I think is the case. Most of the tensions on the panel right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but in reality, I actually I think the tension breaker, and some some of the other people were talking about it before, as the economics change. As it becomes mm. extremely inexpensive to start to do something, it becomes easier to do it. And that's probably where the tension will get broken. As the economics of all the past and all of the IAS vendors keep getting better, then the motion toward let's do that, at least to find out how to do it, will we'll go through the enterprise a little easier. And I think we're getting there, but we're not quite there. And that's probably the biggest factor. Yep. I think the, the, the healthiest part of the tension is that, you know, that I think if the biggest takeaway from this panel, which is there are no real clear answers, but there are questions you need to ask, right? So don't just walk up to, um, you know, um, a public pass and say, okay, let's go, fun, 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 right? I mean, you know, the, if you've heard <coughs> from this panel, you've heard a lot of experts um, to my right and left that have just exposed there are some, you know, there's some interesting questions for you when you start exploring this concept of past. Should I be building something like a Cloud Foundry? Should I be looking at something like a Heroku or, and, and, and be able to go at those two head on, you know, and that, that is, that's a, the healthy yeah. part and of this. I, whole I, I don't see it as a tension. I just see it or as, a healthy tension. Uh, it's not a tension, it's just there's apples and the oranges and which ones do you want? It depends on your needs as an organization. Well, well the, the tension comes in integrating this new uh, technology consumption model that's called platform as a service into the existing uh, IT processes. For example, what's the process to approve a project, approve a technology stack? Am I, as, we, as Dave Casper of UBS mentioned, can I actually go out and deploy my application on Heroku? What's the governance of the application stack? How will the application not, stack? That's, that's how will the application tension. stack? That's not tension. It, that's it, not tension. There, there's tensions because no. these fundamental issues tension. of how to integrate <laughs> the technology <laughs> are, are not actually solved yet. And you're up here making it sound like it's easy, a click of the button, and, and it's not. 
you know, for example, you know, what ha one of the most, uh, if you go out and look at the Red Hat OpenShift blogs, you know, shout out to my competitor, you know, all of the blog articles show how do I actually install this project or this framework on OpenShift? And it's like, why are we beyond that? I mean, it takes me back to Windows 3.1. How do I install this app on Windows mm -hmm. and make it compatible with Windows and configure it on Windows? When we have platform as a service that's talking about all these configuration issues for frameworks, and they just don't, are, they're not just OSGI enabled and they drop light in, right in, everything auto discovers and configures and Some I have an are. API available, that is what, what would be really compelling for developers and to make that, you know, not specific to active states, you know, single vendor product offering, but across the entire ecosystem what would be, you know, very compelling. So Chris Stacy, final word on the uh, topic? I think there's one thing we can all agree on. Chef and Puppet Rock. <laughs> <laughs> Kumbaya. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. Don't, don't argue here. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I think we're out of time. No.